Now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple, and, and the officers of the temple, and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make, make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and said to them, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They begin to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves." You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my Father has conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered for the, with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciple said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied. This passage, really, it centers around conversations that were happening around the table. So I'm simply calling the message this morning, Around the Table. Now, I don't know about you, but in several times in my life, I've been around meal tables, dinner tables in particular, that were full of lots of tension. Have you ever been at a dinner and there was tension at the table? Like you could cut it with a knife? Maybe you were at a, a meeting with some, you know, business executives or whatever, and, and you're sitting there and, and there was just a sense of tension around that table, that dinner table. Probably for a lot of us, the one that would ring the bell is a, the family dinner table. Have you ever been at the family dinner table and one of the children or someone at the table decides to make the big announcement? Like the son tells everybody that he's dropping out of college to join a rock band or something like that. Or the daughter makes her big announcement that she's going to marry the boyfriend that nobody likes. Or dad's got an announcement, he took the position and the family's going to have to move out of state. A lot of tension at tables like that. 
Or maybe, maybe you have the kind of family that when extended family comes in from out of town, there's a little bit of family drama. And so Thanksgiving and Christmas sometimes, or any family dinners with extended family around, can be really tense. If you've ever been at dinner like that, uh, you know it really doesn't matter what's on the menu. It could be filet mignons and the best of food, but you really aren't tasting the food. You ever been, you know, at the table and it just feels like all the room got, all the air got sucked out of the room and it's just heavy and tense? Well, in Luke chapter 22, this all, this, this whole passage really revolves around a dinner table. And this is a tense dinner. A lot is going on here. Because this is, as Luke tells us, the time of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And, and that was a very intense time in Jewish history. It reminded them of their past slavery in Egypt and all that came with that and God's miraculous deliverance. But this isn't just intense because this is Passover and it reminds the Jews of where God has brought them from slavery and oppression. This is also the disciples and everyone at that table's last meal with Jesus. And they become aware of that as the dinner progresses, that, that there's, this is it for Jesus' earthly life. A lot going on around this table. So just think for a moment, just as Laura was reading through the text, of some of the dimensions of what's going on at this table. At this table, there is betrayal. There is Judas, to whom Jesus said, the one who is going to betray me, he is now sitting with me at this very table. At this table is denial, Peter. Jesus informs Peter, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you know me, and Peter sw swore it wouldn't happen. Around this table, there is a new covenant that's being brought into being. Jesus said, drink this cup, of, uh, this cup, which is representing my blood, of the new covenant. That's happening at this table. At this table, Jesus is forming his disciples of their new place in the kingdom that they, having been with him during his time of trial, would be sitting on thrones and judging Israel in the kingdom. Around this table, Jesus informs his disciples uh, that Satan has requested to come after them, Peter in particular, but all of the disciples, Jesus says, Peter has desired, or excuse me, Satan has desired all of you to sift you like wheat. Isn't that like, wouldn't that be nice to know? Um, you know, most Christians deal with junior varsity freshman team demons, but Satan himself has requested personally to come after you. Wow. But Jesus said, I've prayed for you. That's going on at this table. And then Jesus tells his disciples in verses 35 to 37 that things are about to intensify. He had told them on their previous trips, you don't need to bring a purse or a money bag. But now he said, bring a purse and a money bag. And if you haven't, buy a sword. And so persecution is about to come on the church. And so all of this is happening around the table. It's one of those tense dinner parties. Now, obviously... That leaves me with an interesting job. That is, there's a lot to talk about here. And I have been most conflicted on where to focus my attention this morning so that I don't keep you here on Father's Day for way longer than you fathers deserve because I'm sure that marinating steak is just about entering into your mind about this point. So in order for us just to, to center ourselves, what I want to do is I want to make my aim specifically on the subject of the communion table, this Passover meal, known in the church now as the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. So we're going to zero in specifically a discussion on the Passover, um, which again we call the Eucharist or the communion service or the Lord's Supper in the church today. But I, I want to talk about this Passover meal in three ways in particular. So if you are of the persuasion of one who takes notes, you might want to jot these things down. Um, it'll frame up the way we organize ourselves this morning as we specifically focus on this Passover meal. So first of all, number one, I want to look uh, at this meal. First of all, number one, the origins of this meal. The origins of this meal. Secondly, I want us to look at the theology of this meal. And then thirdly, the relevance 
of this meal. And I'm going to go right back over these, so if you didn't catch those, they'll be up on the screen, and we'll go over them one at a time. So first of all, let's, let's start with talking about the origins of this meal. Now, you may have noticed when we read verse 1 that Luke refers to this feast, verse 1, as the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover. Now, the origins of this meal, of course, bring us back to our Old Testament to the time of the Exodus and God's miraculous deliverance of his people after 430 years of bondage and slavery in Egypt. And and there God raises up Moses as the deliverer of his people and brings them through a series of miraculous events. And uh, if you saw the recent, how many saw the recent Exodus movie? That wasn't done by a group of theologians and Bible scholars, uh, like the Noah movie, um, but I did enjoy the special effects, and I enjoyed sitting down with my kids and pointing out where they missed it um, in the biblical record. So some of you guys were like, I can't watch that movie, that's blasphemy. I watched it and said, I got my Bible, I'm not worried. They're not changing the story. Um, but, but in that, we, we see in the Exodus story, um, really God bringing a miraculous deliverance of his people through 10 specific plagues. All water sources turning to blood, frogs and flies and boils and diseases and hail dropping from heaven and darkness cloaking the earth. But the final one, which brings us to the Passover, is that final of the ten plagues in which God was loosening the grip of Pharaoh upon his people was, of course, the death of the firstborn that came over Egypt that night. And it was that very thing that basically caused God to institute this Passover meal that would protect his people from the death that was coming on Egypt. And so I want to take a a side route here for just a second. And if you would, turn with me to the book of Exodus as we look at that story in the Old Testament of God's deliverance of his people and the meal, the Passover meal that we're talking about that Jesus was celebrating on that night, Exodus chapter 12, when you're there, say, I'm there. And if you're not there, say, I'm getting there. And let's pick up in verse 3, Exodus 12. Should be pretty easy to find, second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus. Now God says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family one for each household. Verse 5, the animals you choose must be a year old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the house where they eat the lambs. That same night, They are to eat the meat roasted over fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with the head, the legs, and the internal organs. Do not, verse 10, leave any of it till the morning. If some of it is left till the morning, you've got to burn it. This is how you're to eat. Note this, God says, when you're eating this meal, have your cloak tucked in your belt. That is, you know, they wore those long robes in those days, and when you were ready to move, you would take the bottom part of your robe and you would tuck it into your belt so it looked like more bagging walking, baggy walking shorts kind of thing. Be ready to roll. So have your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And on that same night, verse 12, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment in all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. This blood of the lamb that was slain will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, as Luke records the story, he talks about this being the festival of unleavened bread, which is also the Passover. And if you continue to read the Exodus 12 story, you would find that seven days before the actual Passover meal was this time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in Israel at that time, no one was to eat any leaven or yeast. 
And for those seven days, they were doing sort of a spring cleaning. That is, they were, they were clearing out all leaven from their homes. So they were clearing out cupboards and, and everything that had leaven in it was to be cleared out of the home for seven days. And on the seventh day, then, they would celebrate the Passover feast. Now, for those of you who are very you know, interested in our Hebraic, Judaistic roots of Christianity, I mean, you have to know that Christianity, basically, our root system is from Israel, from the Hebrew peoples. And, and so in order to get a fuller understanding of what it is to walk with Jesus as 21st century Western American Christians, sometimes we got to go back into what they were doing and what the, the Jewish people think and do. And, and there's a few interesting parts of uh, a Passover Seder. And I know that the Puankas, uh this and last Passover, uh, had a group of you, uh, and I think this year it was at Allison Brewer's home, to celebrate Passover together. And you probably saw a lot of beautiful symbolism in that. And among the things that the Jews celebrated at the Passover celebration, one part of that feast, they call it the Afikomen. For those of you guys who are familiar with the Afikomen, it's a very interesting symbolic part of that feast. And what the Jews will do during the Afikomen is they will take three pieces of matzah, the unleavened bread, and they'll stack the three matzahs on top of each other and wrap them in linen. But before they do that, they take the matzah that would be in the middle of the three and they break it in half, take one, that one half of the middle matzah, the second matzah, and wrap it in its own linen and then go and hide it. And then all the kids, the Jewish kids, are sent off to go find the afikomen bread, the, the, the half piece of the middle bread that was broke off, wrapped in linen, and hidden. And the kid that finds it gets a prize, and there's a big celebration. Now, I don't know, like thinking through this, if, if you're starting to maybe pick up on, there's some symbolism here. Because if you were to talk to an Orthodox Jew or a rabbi today, they would be able to explain to you the symbolism of all of the acts that happen at the Passover Seder as they celebrate Passover. The one that they don't have a good explanation for is the afikomen. Why do you take three pieces of matzah, break the one in the middle, wrap it in linen, hide it, and then when it's found, there's a celebration? Well, I think there's some symbolism here that I'm going to suggest, and that is this. I think this speaks of the Godhead. That is three matzahs. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, wrapped in linen, all in one. The one in the middle, the second one, the Son, broken, wrapped, hidden away, and there's joy when he is discovered. Now, why, why if this is actually maybe the symbolism here that, that a Jew wouldn't recognize, why would the middle matzah be broken in two and half of it taken away and hidden away? Well, think about Jesus in his dual nature. The divine and the human. The divine nature was not crucified and buried. It was the human nature taken away, wrapped in linen, and hidden to be discovered. And when it, the, 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 the human side of Jesus, resurrected Jesus, was discovered, there's great joy. But there's another little nuance to this Afi Komen that I, I find very fascinating. And that is this word Afi Komen. You can look it up. It's the one word during the Passover Seder that is not a Hebrew word. It's a Greek word. And the Greek word, get this, means I came. And they're going, we don't know what this is about. We take three matzahs, wrap it up, break one, hide it away. It gets found. We all celebrate. We don't know why. We call it the afikomen, the I came. The incarnation of of Jesus Christ as part of this celebration, this commemoration of what God did in Israel back in Exodus, but it's also a foreshadowing of what's happening here in Luke 22, that the lamb for the slaughter, Jesus the Christ, who would also be there greater than Moses, is sitting at that table instituting this supper with them. And as to God's instructions of the Passover meal, I don't know if you picked up on this, but God is very specific on how the Passover was to be celebrated. Every house was to take a year old male without any defect, verse 5. The blood was to be put 
or excuse me, the lambs were to be slaughtered at twilight, at sunset, verse 6. There was to be blood put on the sides and the tops of the door frames of every house, verse 7. The people were to roast the lamb. You couldn't boil it or eat it raw, and you had to eat it all that night. None of it could be left until the morning, verses 8 through 10. And along with that lamb, they would eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread, all symbolic. And every home that was marked by the blood of the lamb would be protected from the death that was passing over Egypt that night. Now notice, if you're still in Exodus, verse 14. God commanded them, verse 14, note this, this is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Now that's important. He's saying, do this in remembrance of what I have done in delivering you from bondage and from death by the blood of a slain lamb. Then Jesus shows up. For centuries, since the time of Moses, the Jews have been celebrating Passover every year the same way. And then Jesus, this itinerant rabbi from Galilee, comes and changes the whole Passover and says, this Passover is no longer about the lamb that was slain in the Exodus and the deliverance there. This Passover is now about me. I am the deliverer. I am your Moses. I am the lamb that was slain. And I want you, as they did in that day, to partake in a meal that will represent deliverance from evil and death and sin. So Jesus comes and he now begins to reinstitute what the Passover is actually all about. He becomes the Passover. And so, I mean, I don't know who does this. Only like Jesus can you really do this to come and redefine a holiday. Be like, you know, if someone came to your house on Christmas and said, Christmas is no longer about what it used to be about. I'm redefining Christmas. Christmas as you know it is officially changed. Well, Jesus comes on the scene, if you would, and he takes a major Jewish holiday and says, I'm instituting something new. I'm instituting a meal that's about me, not about then, about now, and about what's coming. So so now this is rich in history. There's a lot packed in to this historical side of the meal. But aside from the historical side of the meal, let's talk now together about the second thing I want to look at, and that is the theology of this meal, the theology of this meal. So hold on for a second. We're going to go a little theological, but I think it will be helpful as we consider what we now in the the church in the 21st century in America celebrate what we call the Lord's Supper communion that we take here on a weekly basis um, as it's transitioned from Passover to the Lord's Supper. As Jesus 2,000 years ago institutes this, The church for 2,000 years has been participating in this thing we call the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. But I don't know how aware you are of the fact that within the church, I mean the true church, we don't all agree on the way in which we interact with the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. That is the way that the intensity and involvement we have with the Lord's Supper. Now if you're interested on understanding how the church at large on the scene today, has viewed communion historically and presently, I would recommend a book to you uh, written by a a guy by the name of Gordon T. Smith, and it's called The Lord's Supper, Five Views. And so he goes in depth into the five different views on the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. And essentially there's the Roman Catholic view, there's the Lutheran view, there's the classical Protestant view, there's the Baptist view, which is a newer view, and then there is uh, the Pentecostal view. And, and you probably are aware of some of this that we're going to get into. Um, so if, you, if you're more interested in that, you can uh, get Gordon Smith's book, The Lord's Supper, Five Views. But this morning, I just want to briefly mention to you um, the three main historical views. The ones that are the most broad and wide and old historically. And, I, and then I kind of want to tell you where I land. Because I land somewhere in the middle of two. I, I feel like my life has lived in these funny tensions where I, I can't completely jive with one position and, and I see part of another. And, and, and so, but, but in the church, there are three main historically held views on communion. 
Um, and and if, you, uh, if you're you know, someone who reads Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, then you're aware that these are the three that he points out. Um, I saw someone pump their fist. Shout out to Wayne Grudem over here. All right. Um, so, so Wayne Grudem, he basically says that the three main historically held views on communion, which we're going to do when, when I'm all done talking, um, which hopefully is soon, um, but, but his, he, he points out these three views. The first view is the Roman Catholic view. And some of you are aware of this, maybe you grew up in a Catholic church or a Catholic family, but the, uh, the Roman Catholic view is what we call transubstantiation. And that view essentially says the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. This happens at the moment that the priest during the Mass says, this is my body. And this is an act that can only be performed by a priest. So if you would, the priest has the God-given authority to turn the body and blood into the actual physical body and blood of Jesus miraculously at the table. That's the Roman Catholic view. Uh, The next closest view is the Lutheran view, which was sort of brought in by Martin Luther, and that's called consubstantiation. Um, And that view is an interesting one. It's the one I find most interesting. It's the one I'm least familiar with. And that is Martin Luther's view was this, the bread and the wine remain the same. That is, they don't go through the transubstantiation process that the Roman Catholic view holds. But this view says the real presence of Christ is with the bread and the wine. And Martin Luther, although he rejected the Roman Catholic view, insisted that Jesus saying, this is my body, had to be taken in a more literal sense than we often take take it. So this view has been explained this way. Jesus is present when we take communion in, with, and under the bread of the Lord's Supper. Now you understand why I'm like, I don't totally understand that. That the bread doesn't turn into his body, but it's in, with, and under And so the analogy that's used for this position is as water is present in a sponge, the water is not the sponge, but is present in, with, and under the sponge, and is present wherever the sponge is present. So in that way, the the transubstantiation view, the Roman Catholic view, this becomes the body uh, and blood of Jesus literally. Then the next step down is Martin Luther saying, well, no, that's not true, but It's more real than just saying it's just symbolic that that Jesus is actually in, with, and under. He's present miraculously, literally, when we take communion. And then there's the third view, and that is the mainline Protestant view, which uh, has been called transsignification. None of this really matters, um, but, but we are going somewhere with this as we talk about the theology around this. And you can pick up Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology for more specifics if this is something that interests you. Um, but, but the mainline Protestant view, the transsignification view, views the Lord's Supper as having a symbolic and spiritual presence of Christ in a unique way, but it's not physical and literal in that sense. Now, where do I land? By upbringing and background, I land way more Protestant transsignification that this is symbolic. But the longer I read my Bible, the more I read Paul, the more I, I step into church history, I can see some beauty and even some challenge to me in, in the consubstantiation view that there's more to this meal than just a spiritual um, signification, but actually that, that Jesus is present beautifully and uniquely and maybe literally in this meal. Now, I, I say that to say it doesn't really matter where we land. I think we can wrestle with it, grapple with it, talk about it, but this is what we call often um, the open-handed issue in the church. You can be a Christian and believe transubstantiation, even though some radical Protestants don't think you can be. Um, you can hold the, the, the really like, loose Baptist view and say it's just a symbol and be a Christian, and you can be everywhere in between. You, you can hold the Pentecostal view, which would, would probably lean more towards that the body and blood of Jesus has healing virtue in it, according to 1 Corinthians 11. But but that that alone is is not the issue that that I want to make here. And The issue for me theologically is this. The main truth is verse 19, what Jesus said. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That, brothers and sisters, is the issue with communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. 
Jesus says, this is the way I want to be remembered. I want you to eat this meal and remember me. I want you to remember me, Jesus said. So this meal now is about Jesus, not the exodus that was, but now the new exodus that Jesus brings in theologically. Um, The way that Jesus has rescued us as both lamb and ultimate deliverer. Now, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 26, interesting verse about communion. I want you to think about this as you consider, what is my view on communion? When I go to that table and I grab that cracker and that cup of, that little small cup of juice, what is that, just a little light snack before we greet each other and, you know, or whatever? Like, what, what, is the, what is the point of us doing this? And as you start to think, what, what am I expecting from God when I eat and drink? What is the meaning and significance? Is it just a symbol? Is it my way of saying, Jesus, we remember what you have done? Or do I anticipate and expect Jesus to literally meet me in the sacrament, to meet closely with me in the sacrament? Um, but that said, listen to what Paul says, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So one thing Paul says is every time you eat and drink, you are proclaiming a gospel truth. You're proclaiming the work of Jesus every time you eat and drink. So this becomes a gospel issue. This becomes a beautiful sacramental activity that the church can regularly and is called to regularly participate in. Now you're saying, well, what is a sacrament? Well, sacrament, I'll give you the definition that I like best. A sacrament is basically, as defined by one theologian, a rite in which God is uniquely active. In other words, God meets with us in a special way when we do this. Do you believe that about the Lord's Supper? When you come and eat and drink of the Lord, do you believe God is uniquely, specially meeting with us in this act at the table? So Paul points out that this is a way that we proclaim the Lord's death The theological significance is basically, for us, this is a meal causing us to remember a covenant that Jesus made, a meal that when celebrated is a proclamation of the Lord's death, but also this is a meal, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, that when not celebrated properly brings judgment. And Paul would add, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is a meal when not properly observed, many are sick and diseased, and some have even died. Now, those aren't my words. You can go unpack those and deal with Paul. But this is a serious meal. Paul said, when you go to take communion, let a man first examine himself, lest he eat and drink unworthy. Now, does it mean that we have to examine ourselves if we are worthy to be eating and drinking of the body and blood of Jesus? No, The idea Paul is getting at is that we must approach Jesus as worthy. When we sing and praise God, we say worthy is the lamb, not worthy is Brian. The the worth is not me. It is me examining myself. Am I being serious about this? Am I stepping into this with an expectant, hopeful heart? I'm expecting to meet Jesus at the table today. And so I hope it never becomes a routine where you're like, oh yeah, this is just the thing church people do. Pop the cracker, drink the juice. I kind of know how this goes. But rather it should be a time as you walk up to that sacred table where you say, I expect to meet with the good Lord Jesus here. I'm not just remembering him. I'm interacting with him right now. See, if if it becomes just symbolic, then we become a people who remember something like a historical marker of what was But Jesus says, I'm not just the God who was, I am the God who is and who is to come. So when you eat and drink, you should expect, I'm going to interact with a living Lord right now. And however he comes, I'm expecting it to be beautiful, personal, and tangible. And therefore, that's why we put such an emphasis on the Lord's Supper. Because we believe that God does tremendous things when we come to the table of the Lord. That there is healing at the table of the Lord. 
that there is remembrance of a covenant that God made, that there is a time of a self-examination, there's a time of forgiveness and reinstituting your covenant with God, a time of confession of sin, of celebrating His life that is now being lived in you and through you. Beautiful things, brothers and sisters, can potentially happen for a people of faith who step into this theologically and said, I expect to meet with Jesus at the table every time I eat and drink with Him and my brothers and sisters, whether that's at my missional community, at a friend's house, in my living room with my family, or at church on Sunday morning, I expect to meet with the Lord Jesus in this act. So we have a couple of really important things for us to understand if we're going to continue to walk with God as disciples in understanding the Passover meal, the communion feast, the Lord's Supper. It has historical roots to it, Exodus 12, that Jesus transitioned and said, I am the lamb, I am the deliverer, this is the new Exodus. The theological ramifications, the church has viewed this in a variety of ways. We step into it saying that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, what Jesus said, this is my body that has been given for you and I'm instituting a new covenant. We need to step into that covenant. But here's how I want to land the plane this morning. If none of this is resonating with you and you're just like, okay, consubstantiation, transsignification, transubstantiation, who cares? Exodus 12 and Afi Komen, I don't care. Here's, here's where, I, where I believe that the relevance for us comes, and that's the third thing I want to talk about, and that is the relevance of the meal. How can this meal have a transforming effect on my life? Well, I want you to note this. How is this meal relevant? Remember, this is a meal that comes with a promise. Look at verse 16. Jesus said, I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus said, I won't eat like this again until I eat it with you in the kingdom. Then, look down at verse 18. Jesus again says, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Did you catch what Jesus just said? I'm celebrating something with you now, and this is the last time I will eat or drink until I bring you into the kingdom. So he's saying essentially, I'm not eating or drinking again until I see you in the kingdom. In other words, I promise to bring you in. You are going to make it into the kingdom because I have vowed not to eat or drink until I bring you, I have you with me in the kingdom. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, it's significant for several reasons, but in the first century world, this was common. Like Jesus saying this, they'd be like, oh, okay, we get that. Because in the first century, when someone wanted to make an oath, a passionate oath about something they were very serious about, they would make what they called a blood oath. They would vow to abstain from something until something else was accomplished. You find that in Acts chapter 23, verse 12. There was a group of Jewish haters hating on Paul. Acts 23, 12, this group of Jewish men, it says that they bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. And we know they didn't kill Paul, so they must have been really skinny. Right, But they said, we are so passionate about getting this accomplished that we won't eat or drink until we've accomplished it. Jesus says, I'm so passionate about getting you to land in the kingdom that I won't eat or drink until I drink it with you again in the kingdom. Jesus hasn't had a sip of wine or a bite of that bread because he's waiting to eat it with you. He ate it the last time with his disciples, Luke 22. He's going to eat it the next time with you. This is hope. This is promise. This says you can trust God because he's taken a blood oath. He said, I will get you to your destination. I'm so passionate about being with you in the kingdom. You can trust me. I'm under an oath. I will not eat or drink until I get you there. Do you trust Jesus? The easy answer is yes. But what's the truth? Do you trust Jesus with your afterlife? Do you believe that no sin you could commit, 
No wrong you could do, no condemnation, no death, no disease could separate you from Jesus, that he will bring you home. Do you trust Jesus with your life? Do you trust Jesus with your eternal life? Do you trust Jesus with your temporal life? That's where most of us get whacked. Oh yes, Jesus, you've got me in the sweet by and by, but I don't know if you've got me right now. Or if he's got you then then he's got you now. He said, I am going to make sure that you make it. So whatever happens to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, come hell or high water, Jesus has said, I'm under a blood oath to get you there. So everything that's happening to you had to first pass through me, and I am going to be the one to see you home. I am under an oath to do so. So what's life handing you right now? Are you tempted not to trust? Jesus said, this is my covenant with you. I'm going to bring you home. So things that happen to you are things that I'm going to see you through. I'm going to walk you through. That there is no death, no sin, no devil in hell. Nothing that can prohibit you from entering into the kingdom life that Jesus has said, I'm in a covenant with you for this. I steal this from Timothy Keller because he's awesome. But he uses a a really important analogy for me to illustrate our, our faith. Like when I ask that question, do you trust Jesus? Most of us feel like not well enough. Oh, me of little faith. I feel like that, that should just be inscripted over my life. It's gonna be on my tombstone. Oh, me of little faith. I want great faith but I feel like I'm the man of little faith. Timothy Timothy Keller illustrated it this way. He said, it's like you're falling off a cliff, let's just say. While falling off that cliff, you notice that there is a branch on the side of the cliff. But you don't know if that branch is strong enough to hold you and keep you from falling. How much faith is it going to take for you to take hold of that branch? Do you have to know with absolute certainty that that branch can hold you? No. All you have to do is reach out and say, I'm going to take a chance. I'm reaching out. Because your faith is not in your faith. We don't have faith in faith. So it isn't the strength of your faith. It's the object of your faith that holds you still. It isn't you having a lot of faith. It's you having faith. A little faith in God. He's strong. He can hold you. So as you're falling and wondering how life is going to work out and you see Jesus as strong and you don't know if you even trust him, reaching out to him, eating and drinking is all you need to be held up. Because he is strong when you are not. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. So don't worry about how much faith you have, just say, I believe, help my unbelief, I'm reaching out, Jesus hold me up. I feel like I'm falling. And Jesus said, that's it, I got you. That's all I need. Reach out, take communion, believe by faith. This is a blood oath that Jesus took, I can trust him with my afterlife, my eternal life, and my temporal life. He's got it from beginning to end. I'm not worried about the beginning. I had no choice in that, right? My five-foot, nothing mom, 100 pounds, gave birth to this big, fat, eight-pound, eight-ounce boy. That was nothing to do with me. That was Jeff and Margie. They did all that. My mom gave me birth. I'm not worried about my beginning. And I'm not so much worried about my end. I don't know. Am I going to get shot? Am I going to have cancer? Will I just be an old, bald, toothless man, and I'm just going to die of old day? I don't know. I'm not going to hit by a truck today. I can't do anything about my beginning and I can't do anything about my end, and I freak out about the middle. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, you couldn't control your birth date, you can't control your death date, and you can't control anything else. Welcome to life in the hand of God. So every time I take communion, I say, God, this is a supper that reminds me that whatever you're doing in my life, I can trust you. This is a meal that comes with the promise. And then finally, This is a meal that teaches us about the nature of sacrificial love. 
Jesus is sharing this supper with his disciples on the very night that was symbolized by a slain lamb. In Egypt, on that very night that Jesus is sharing the supper, in every house in Egypt in the Exodus, in every house there was either going to be a dead son or a dead lamb. There would be death in the house that night. If it was a dead lamb, then there would not be a dead son. If there was no dead lamb, there would be a dead son. And ironically, Jesus is sitting at the table that's commemorating the exodus that he's now bringing a new exodus to, saying, I'm not only the slain lamb, I'm also the slain son. That the slain son is the slain lamb. And I am bringing you the new exodus. I am saving you. The son who is also a lamb. But, but I, we, need to, we need to note this at the end, and that is this. The lesson we learn at the communion table is that saving love has to be sacrificial. Saving love, all true love, is sacrificial. Have you ever wondered why? Why does God make there be a sacrifice? Why did there have to be bloodshed? Couldn't God if he wanted to just forgive and say, oh, you know what, I'm big enough to forgive this. There doesn't need to be in any blood. What is he, some bloodthirsty God that needs to be appeased? I mean, what view of God do you have, especially when you think that he must slaughter in order to be appeased in his wrath? But what the blood of Jesus in part teaches us, what the shed blood, the sacrificial love that Jesus shows us is that he points that all love is sacrificial and substitutionary in nature if it's actual love. In other words, in order to love anyone, if you're going to love someone, truly love someone, in their brokenness and in their trouble and in their heartache and in their pain, which everyone is broken and in trouble, and a few, you know, there may be a few people in Cary that aren't, you know, go meet them, become their friend. But other than that, I mean, most people that you're going to love are broken and troubled in some fashion. And if you're going to really love them, you're going to have to love them with sacrificial, substitutionary love. That is, in order to help them, you're going to have to give something up. To step into their life, to, to step into their pain, you're going to have to absorb some of their pain. To lift them up, you're going to have to go down. To fill up their empty spaces, you're going to have to empty yourself. There is pain in all real love. I mean, let's bring this to bear on some of the relationships that perhaps you currently have. Maybe you're in a relationship with someone who's really in financial trouble and you really love this person. If you're really going to love them, then it's probably going to cost you some money because that's the area of their great pain. Or, or maybe you're loving someone who is emotionally devastated and distraught. If you're going to truly love them, you know what's going to happen? You are going to absorb some of that. You're going to come alongside them and say, I love you and I'm willing to step into your pain. But in doing so, I am going to be pained myself. That is sacrificial substitutionary love. Or if you've ever had the very painful experience of walking with someone who has a, had some form of chemical addiction or some addictive, destructive behavior in their life, and you try to love them through it, you know how much that costs. That's the tough side of love. That's the sacrificial, emotional, giving, time-consuming, life-sucking type of love. I mean, I've been in a church work for most of my adult life since I was 19 years old. I've walked with a lot of families and individuals through addiction and substance abuse, and I have seen the toll it takes on those who are trying to love the addictive person. I see the kind of tough love and the tough decisions they have to make, the times that they have to give, the times they have to back away. That's all part of the process of saying, I'm going to love in a way that's sacrificial. If you want to love and keep your life from being spent and keep your life safe, then you won't actually love and they will perish. But if you say, no, I love these people too much, it will cost you something great to really love. So Jesus' bloodletting is the least of what he gave on the cross. You know how little the New Testament talks about the physical side of the cross? It almost gives it no mention, especially the apostles. 
Now, I used to, as a pastor, spend a lot of time, every time we'd get to Good Friday, every time we, I talk about crucifixion, I was talking about the flagellum, cat of nine tails. I was going, passion of the Christ. Look at how Jesus was beaten, and I would go physical, gnarly. His internal organs were probably exposed. His back reduced to hamburger meat. They punched him in the face. His face was swollen. I'd go detail. Shoulders out of joint, up and down on a beaten back, on a splintery cross, trying to force air into his lungs. His, inside his, the pericardium, the, the sac inside of his heart explodes, and the inside he's bleeding out internally, and blood and water flows. And I, I just go big time on the physical side. New Testament does hardly any of that. You know, you know what New Testament does? In most of your Bible, when it talks about crucified Jesus, it says he suffered, but it wasn't physical. We would all agree he suffered physically. But that, is, that can't be the extent of his suffering. Most of the Bible's record of Jesus' suffering is spiritual and emotional suffering that we know very little about. I mean, listen to some of the biblical language about what happened to Jesus on the cross. Talk about a love that costs. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You, you and I don't understand that. We've never been sinless, and we wouldn't know what it was like to be so pure and to take on all sin. I mean, think of some of the atrocious things that have been done, things we would call sin. This last week was terrible. And Jesus said, I absorbed that. He who did not know any sin became sin. I have no idea what that would be like, to be tainted by sin. If you've ever done something very grievous, I talk to a lot of people that have committed adultery on their spouse, and they talk to me about the after effect, and it, they, they, they talk about this sense of filth and defilement that they feel. I feel so dirty. I remember I, I, I read the take um, on... Uh, I forget the name of the pastor, but he, he, he committed adultery on his wife, and he wrote a whole book on it um, about his sin, which wasn't just sexual. And he talked about right after the act of adultery, going in and turning the water up in the shower as hot as he could to, to rinse off the filth. It was a soul film. That's one sin from one man. Jesus clean takes on all sin and absorbs it he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be righteous. It, I don't even understand that. He was defiled with all the defilement so that you could get off and be clean. The prophet Isaiah, when writing about Jesus, says things about his physical afflictions that they had spiritual ramifications. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for iniquity, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. All the physical afflictions are associated with his forgiving act. He was pierced to bring forgiveness, crushed because we're iniquitous, punished to bring us peace, healing by his wounds. Isaiah 53, verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And when Jesus was on the cross, we get a little glimpse into what he was feeling like when he was becoming sin. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, Jesus cries out one of his last statements from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, in the Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I feel far from you, Father. I feel filthy. I don't even call you Father. He said, you are my God, not my Father right now. Never felt further. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. As Jesus, as we'll see in this chapter next week, was in the garden before he was going to be taken to the cross, was in ultimate soul anguish, so much so that an angel had to be sent to strengthen Jesus in that hour, in the garden of Gethsemane. Luke 22 Verses 43 and 44, it says, As Jesus was praying in the garden, as he prayed in his anguish, he sweat. his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. You, you and I have no idea the cost. So if we misunderstand, like, why does God want blood? Blood is the least of the issue. Blood's like this much of the hole that Jesus gave. 
Why did Jesus have to die? Why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? To remind us of the nature of love. Sacrificial and substitutionary in nature. Jesus know, knows like no one else what love costs. I wanted to read something to you from John Stott in his book, The Cross of Christ. He writes an interesting story, a fictional story, but one that I think will resonate as we talk about the cost. So just listen, kind of, just kind of relax for a second. And listen to this. It is the end of time. Billions of people are gathered in small clusters on a large plane. A low rumble from the sound of their conversations floats across the air. And suddenly, a woman stands up, rolls up the sleeve of her blouse, and shouts, God, how can you judge me? Look at this. And on her arm is the tattoo of a swastika with seven numbers underneath. I died in Auschwitz for nothing more than my ethnic background and my religious belief. How can you judge me? Then the voice of a man rings out, Yeah, God, what about this? He asks, unbuttoning the collar of his shirt to real, reveal rope marks around his neck. I was hung for no other reason than the color of my skin. How can you judge me? Next, a Japanese woman comes forward saying, And what about me? I was only a young girl when the blast went off in Hiroshima. How can you judge me? Hearing these arguments, the entire crowd begins to shout its assent until finally these three people, along with others who had gone through very painful experiences, joined together and approached God saying, Before you can judge any of us, you must first be sentenced to life on earth as a man so that you can see and understand what, you, what we have gone through. But to ensure that you don't make it too easy on yourself, you must be born in such a way that the legitimacy of your birth will be questioned and people will call you a bastard. Yes, shouted the crowd. Secondly, you must be born to a racially persecuted and oppressed people. Yeah, shouted the crowd. Thirdly, you must grow up in a working class and denied a formal education. That's right, the crowd concurs. Fourthly, you'll have to champion a cause so just and so radical that every religious organization and political body will be against you. And finally, you must be, be betrayed by one of your closest friends, sold out for an insignificant amount of money, brought before a cowardly judge on false charges, indicted by a prejudiced jury, and sentenced to die in the most excruciatingly painful way devised by man. And at that, the crowd went wild until suddenly... On that plain, covered by billions of people, had become so quiet you could hear a nail drop as all of humanity at last realizes that God has already served his sentence. Love cost him everything. Love is costly. And the lesson that we learn from Luke 22 around this table As we come to the Lord's Supper, the relevance of this meal for us is that this is a meal that comes with the promise of redemption. So when you eat and drink today, just say, God, you promised to see me through. And I don't know how it's going to work out from my birth date to my death date, but it's going to work out. You're under a blood oath, a promise of redemption. I'll be back I won't eat and drink until I take you home. You're going to be with me in the kingdom. Your afterlife is settled. Your temporal life is settled. Be of good cheer, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He doesn't have ill in mind for you. I know it feels like it sometimes. I know when you try to sort out the Charleston, South Carolinas of life or the personal troubles that you go through and you think, oh God, why? And he said, be of good cheer. In this world you'll have tribulation, but I've overcome. And every time you eat and drink, remember, he's under a blood oath to make it okay. I think someone here just needs to hear it's going to be all right. It's going to be better than all right. Jesus promised it would be so.
So what's the hell you think you're going through right now? Jesus said, kingdom promise at the end of this. And then finally, we remember as we go to the communion table this morning that this feast that we partake of is a reminder of what love costs, of what it cost him and what it costs every person who chooses to walk the way of Jesus. The people that you love most will cost you the most. You'd say, I'd rather not spare that expense than you live a loveless life. What if Jesus would have been that way? He wasn't that way. He gave it all. That's why his blood was shed. And that's why the Lord's Supper is such a celebratory place for us to be, amen?